Welcome to It's All About the Questions, where learning to ask the right questions can help you achieve lifelong success. Now, here to help you ask all the right questions is award-winning author, international speaker, and business strategist, Laura Stewart. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Thanks to all my listeners from around the world, around the time zones. We are grateful. Um, I am grateful for all of you because you are why I do this show every week. Well, if I want to be a little selfish, I do it for myself, too, because I love talking to all my guests on the show. I get major ahas every single guest that I have on the show. Even if they're somebody that I've known for a really long time, somehow, some reason, that guest is the perfect guest for me for the week for whatever's going on in my life. And that's no different for today because I have somebody on the show today that has, my God, I don't even know how long I've been friends with him. We'll have to try to figure that out. Knew him from my tech days, and he's done a major role reversal, career reversal, but he kind of stayed a little bit more in the geekdom than I did for a while there. And I just love talking to him because his insights to me are so brilliant, mostly because they're, they seem so obvious after he says them out loud. But for some reason, I don't see them until after he said it. So I love that about him. So my guest today is Howard M. Cohen. He calls himself a senior resultant, and I love it. And it's because he said he has always understood that we are all measured only by our results. So, Howard, welcome to the show. Thank you, Laura. I I have to admit to you that after hearing that last ad, I really felt like, you know, coming on like this and saying, Hi, this is Howard Cohen with my Mr. Movie Phone voice. Because (laughs) that guy was great. Yeah, wasn't that a, for those of you listening on the podcast? This is um, when when I do the show. It's live broadcast radio. You know the typical in the car radio yep. dial kind of thing. Uh, so we cut the commercials out, but the commercial just before this started was for I think it was a security company or something. Yeah, and yep. Yep. the guy who does the voiceover on the commercial is truly uh, intense. Radio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I also want to acknowledge that I picked up on the time zone. Um, uh, you mentioned time zones, everybody in the time zones. I, I realize that that was a reference to the fact that I live in the only place in the world that doesn't move its clocks forward or back. Yeah, I don't Times, get that. <laughs> yeah, neither do I. Time stands still in Arizona. I used to think it was because a lot of people here wouldn't be able to figure out how to turn their clocks forward or back, but that's, yeah, I don't know. But you can't say that anymore because you live there. Exactly. Huh? <laughs> I, I remember um, visiting Arizona, and then I had to cross the border to somewhere. I forget where it was on the day of the time change, and I got completely confused when I had to go back because did they change, didn't they change, what time zone was I in? And in the course of a day, I'd crossed the line several times, and I was completely <clears throat> thrown off, and I, I screwed up the appointments I was supposed to be at, and they all laughed because they said it happens all the time. <laughs> Yeah, my, my first year here, I had a week of calendar disaster twice because I just couldn't figure out how everything didn't stay the same. But yeah, it's, kind of, it's, it's kind of crazy. It is kind of crazy, and I have listeners from all over the world, so I never know what time zone somebody's in who may be listening to it. Thus, my opening of good morning, afternoon, and evening. So well taken. So, so Howard, when we were um, when we reconnected. Um, a year or two ago, I don't even remember. It was just like no time had passed, which is what I love about <laughs> chatting with you. And can, I'd love it if you could explain to my listeners how you migrated from where you were to becoming this amazing content creator and writing content for people that creates results. Because it's not where you were, but it's where you morphed into. And it's pretty amazing a journey. Because you asked yourself a lot of questions to get there. Yeah, I did. Um, (laughs) First of all, let me start by saying that I first thought about um, starting a career as a writer when I was eight years old. Um, I was in second grade, and I had a wonderful, wonderful English teacher named Helen Ogden, who just motivated me like there's no tomorrow. Uh, All I could do was write. My friends were outside playing. I was in my house writing. And uh, never really stopped. Uh, When I started my career in the IT industry, um, it didn't stop then either, really, because I just kept on writing my own 
marketing materials, my own press releases, everything. I just, I never hired writers. I just did it all myself. Um, I entered the industry, and now we find out why my title is senior resultant. I entered the industry in 1982. And so I had a, a good 33-year run uh, up through 2005. And it's very funny because just this morning, T.C. Doyle covered my last industry company, MTM, uh, in the Doyle Report. Oh, really? Kind of, I yeah, have to get a copy of that. It's kind, of, kind of funny, but um, MTM doesn't resemble what it looked like back then. And what had happened was that the same, um, the same financial group, Pequot Capital, had come in and put a major investment into MTM. This is the same group that had done Ameridata many years ago and stretched out to 140 locations nationwide. They decided to do it again, but this time instead of focusing on products, they focused on services. And the entire executive team was summarily replaced. I don't think they really made a lot of decisions about us. Um, they wanted fresh new, and I understood that. I stayed long enough to help with transition. They appreciated it. Um, they allowed me to leave gracefully, which was you know, better than I expected. Um, but they were really gentlemen about it. And when I left, I was faced with a decision. Uh, what do I want to do next? And um, a very good friend of mine um, sat down with me and said, you know what? I'm going to make a suggestion. I never make a suggestion, but I'm going to make a suggestion. I said, okay. He said to me, you know, you're the guy that always writes everything, and actually I've turned to you to write things for me, and I know other people have done the same. You love to write. You know the industry. You write well. You know, a cousin of mine took on a career as a corporate copywriter. And, um, you know, maybe it's something you want to consider. So you ask about questions. The first question I had to ask myself was, do I want to work for myself? That's a big question that a lot of people really don't ask themselves. Very true. I wish I had asked myself that question 30 years sooner. Um... The immediate answer was yes, uh, but I think the firm answer came, and I'm going to give a, a shameless plug to somebody else here. Uh, it came after I read a book called The Well-Fed Freelancer. Uh, it's by a gentleman by the name of Peter Bowerman, it's B-O-W-E-R, Bowerman. Um, that book just answered the question for me. Bowerman was an executive in a corporation who couldn't take it anymore. He hated corporate life. He hated the rat race. He hated the politics. Sounded familiar to me. And his response was, I'm going to go and try to be a freelance writer. And he, he claims, and I'm predisposed to believe him, he claims that he was financially self-sustaining within three months. Wow, that's pretty fast. It was hugely fast. And I said, that, how is that possible? And so his response, and this is, this is the best thing anybody could have said to me at that time. He basically says that there are only four things that you need to be a well-fed freelancer. The first is that you should have an industry that you know. Okay, I knew IT well. Number two, you should have people in that industry that you know well enough that maybe you could make them clients or they could refer you to clients. Okay, I know a lot of people. Number three, and I think this one's the make or breaker for a lot of people, you need to have the ability to market and sell yourself. That's a big one. <laughs> it's a huge one. I, I, I figured I've been selling other people's talent for 30-some-odd years in the IT industry. So if I can sell them, I can sell me. And then the last one, he said, yeah, it would be good if you knew how to write. And he's very cavalier about it because he says, you don't even have to be a good writer. And, you know, you look at websites today, you look at blogs and magazines, there are plenty of people writing professionally who write okay. 
and they have a decent career. They have a good career. So it's not just a skill in writing. It's a skill in being able to get your writing out there. That really makes the difference. And it all started with the question of, do I want to work for myself? Yeah. Do I want to work for myself? And, you know, do I have the guts to do that? Um, I realized very quickly that there was another question right behind that. And that question wasn't a question for myself. It was a question for my wife. It was a question of, would you be comfortable with me working for myself? And her immediate answer was, absolutely. Whatever it is you want to do, I'm there behind you a thousand percent. You can understand why I love this woman deeply. Yeah, um, keep her. <laughs> no. but, but to me, that, that was a very important question because there's, I don't think there's any way anybody can do things like this without support. Perhaps from a spouse or significant other, perhaps from friends, perhaps across the board. But that support is necessary. And I've been blessed with terrific support. I think that's really important that you talked about that second question of once you've understood what you need for yourself to to bring somebody else on board, to engage them into that relationship with you, because otherwise it's going to make it that much harder. And we've seen stuff like that deteriorate left and right all over the place. I hear stories all the time. And when we come back, Howard, let's go into that and start talking about how you people actually can create content that converts and we'll be right back with more from Howard M. Cohen. Howard, when you decided to create this career for yourself of Mm -hmm. being a content creator, what was it about that that made you get excited about it? Because, I mean, you're creating content for a lot of other people and it's about creating content that converts, right? It's not just... People don't keep hiring you over and over again unless they're getting some results from what you're writing for them. Right. So how do you how do you do that? I mean, how do you put that together when you're writing for other people? That's a that's an interesting question. Um, one of the things that I do with every new client I take on is to have a session with them where we just sit and talk about their company. Um, I want to pick up two things there. One is I want to pick up their messaging, their you know how they present their company. Most companies dream of having a uniform and consistent elevator pitch that all of their people use, but very few companies achieve it. Um, I've achieved it in more than one company because I think it's that important. And so I try to strive to find out what that would be if they had it and maybe encourage them to to spread it around their people. The other thing that I pick up is the voice of the company. Um, Every company has a culture. Every culture trickles down from the top of the company. So even if I'm not talking to the CEO, I'm talking to somebody who's lived there and has attitudes based on their culture and speaks based on their culture, and I work to absorb that and come to understand it. And I try very hard to always imbue that into the writing. Um, Because you're right. I mean, one person writing marketing copy for lots of different people, it could all start looking the same. But I like to think I've never been guilty of that because I really, I I do a lot of, um, I don't know, self-hypnosis. I don't know what it is, but... I, I work hard to have a different voice that aligns with my client's voice, which, by the way, it can be very schizophrenic. <laughs> you know, when, okay. when you're writing several things a day, and in the middle of the third thing, you realize, oh, my God, I'm talking about something that the last company you know, does. <laughs> so you have to kind of back up and say, you know, get into a new mindset. Uh, and, and that's happened, you know, but it's never gotten past it's never gotten out to a client. Sometimes it's funny. Um, but so your, your core question was, you know, why, why, what gets me excited about doing this? Um, there's a, con- and I'm not big on 
sports analogies, but there is a concept that seems to be primarily from sports that people refer to commonly as the zone, being in the zone. Um, a tennis player takes a swing at a ball, and even before they make contact, they know it's going to be a perfect shot. They feel it. Um, they're in the zone. You know, a golfer, you know, somebody who's bowling. I mean, it doesn't matter what the sport is. You just know sometimes that this is going to be great. And it's a form of catharsis. Well, writing has always been that for me since I was eight years old. Writing is a catharsis. When I'm writing, I'm doing what I was meant to do. And I love the fact that I know that. I feel great about it. Um, but for me, the accomplishment of writing something that makes a client say, wow, that's everything. That is just everything. And um, it's never, it, it's, I'm always in the zone when I'm writing. Now, what I, about just, some of my, a lot of my listeners, right, don't write. And it, it's not something that lights them up. Mm-hmm. But it's important for their businesses to be able to write content. What, what piece of advice would you give them to, be, to help them begin putting together great content? Okay, so in a very self-serving mode, the ultimate alternative is to hire a freelance writer, preferably one who knows your industry. Um, I say that because that's been a big business advantage for me. My clients appreciate the fact that they don't have to do a lot of hand-holding. They don't have to teach me the technology. They just have to tell me about their business. Um, I, I suspect that there are freelance writers today who are out there. You can look at Freelancers Union. There's a lot, a lot of other websites you can go to. You can Google freelance writers, but um, that's the ultimate. Um, I think that I know that I've encountered a lot of people who consider themselves to be very good writers. Some of them are wrong. <laughs> it's just that simple. Yeah. Some of them are not good writers, and I, you know, I don't try to argue with them, certainly, but that's just what it is. Others are good writers. They have good sentence structure, good syntax, great spelling, punctuation, everything's right. You know, they're, technically, they're good writers, but they're not compelling writers. They're not writing a compelling message. And from the very beginning of trying to market my writing, the first thing I came up with is that my gig is compelling content. All right. How do you determine what is compelling content? Well, my definition for it, because there isn't one elsewhere, thank God, uh, (laughs) my definition for it is compelling writing is writing that grabs the reader gets them to read, and convinces them to take an action specified at the end. So anybody who's had any contact at all with marketing, with marketing knows that the end of any marketing piece should contain a call to action. Marketers like to call it a CTA because they're so acronym-heavy, but a call to action that is easy to take and makes sense. So in the world of the Internet, it's click here to get more information. That's a call to action. Um, Learn more is a call to action. It's a gentle call to action. Your call to action can be strong. It can be hammered home, or it can be light. It really depends upon your audience and what you think the audience is going to uh, respond to. But everything in... Everything in the marketing piece has got to be engineered to compel the reader to take that action. So it needs to build to that call to action. Absolutely. All right. We're going to be going into the the news break, so I don't want to get started too deep into the segment we're going to do after the news. But for my listeners, throw out a question to them of something they need to be thinking about about their business so that when they come back, they can use that to begin creating some marketing. Okay, so you know, coming straight from your last question, uh, think about email. 
and ask yourself the following three questions, really. Um, there are two things that will get a reader to open an email. One is if you have a very um, compelling uh, subject line. Now, if the subject line is provocative, people will generally open that email. Uh, if you say something like, you know, big sale this weekend, that's not going to do it. Um, the house is burning. Yeah, that might do it. Uh, the other thing that can draw them in is the name of the sender. If it's a name they recognize, they'll very likely open the email. Then there's the third thing. The first sentence of the first paragraph is all you have to convince the reader to read the rest of your message. Okay, so we're going to dangle with that going into the news bake. We'll be right back with more from Howard M. Cohen about creating compelling content that works. Welcome to It's All About the Questions, where learning to ask the right questions can help you achieve lifelong success. Now, here to help you ask all the right questions is award-winning author, international speaker, and business strategist, Laura Stewart. Welcome back, everybody that's joining us on the radio and live on the radio here today. And for those on the podcast, ha, it was a blink and you were back, right? You didn't even notice it since I cut out the commercials from the air. We are here with Howard M. Cohen, <laughs> senior resultant and a, a dear friend of mine who I'm so happy I got reconnected with. We're talking about creating compelling content that works. And during the break, Howard and I were talking about something really kind of fascinating. And, and I'm going to share this story because it leads into what Howard's going to share with you. The other night, my mom and I went out to dinner with her friends. And we actually walked out of the restaurant without being served. There are a couple of things that happened to propel us to that moment. But essentially it was they changed the menu and took out what we knew were the most popular items on the menu. And the service was really horrible. An hour and a half after being there, we meals were not out, and we just kept hearing excuse after excuse after excuse. And when they called me the next day to say, oh, my God, we can't believe you walked out. That reflects so badly on us. And I'm like, like, the service didn't reflect so badly on you. The walking out was where you saw the issue. But anyway, the conversation I had with them was, are you even listening to the people that are coming in to see what they want? Or are you just deciding this is what they want? Because we're not the first person to be complaining about all the changes that you're making that don't make sense. So, Howard, you know, using that as an example, it sort of fits with what you're, talk what you're talking about, making yeah. the subject line, the sender, and, and that first sentence. Um, you really need to understand your audience and, and what they want. So how does somebody begin to do that? in their business. So it's, it's funny. I, I frequently am called upon to give a session that I created called writing with your ear. And it's writing with your ear because one of the most important tools a writer has is their ability to listen. Um, you can't just listen. You can't just be listening to your client. If you're writing for them, you need to be listening to the customer and listening on multiple levels. You, most important, you just put your finger on it, most important is to listen to what they want. You know, people don't come to your website to see how wonderful you are. They come to your website to find something they need and see if you can provide it. So you have to know what that is if you're going to be able to be relevant to it, if you're going to be able to reach it and connect with it and bring them into your website to learn more. Um, so what they want is very important. A, a good friend of mine tells me that every customer in the world has the same favorite radio station, WIIFM, What's In It For Me Radio. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Isn't that great? That was Richard Lociel from St. Louis, good friend. Um, and... Um, I, it just lives with me. Um, everybody's very focused on what they need, what they want, and whether or not you can provide it. And that's fair. Why would they do business with you if you didn't have what they want? The, the second level at which you have to be listening is the level um, at which the customer speaks. You know, what is their vernacular? You know, what are their colloquialisms? What 
do they under what's their terminology you know it, it, all too often technology people are accused of using too much jargon you know well the PCM can be connected to the TCP IP and then you know, yeah i get it you know that's that's obnoxious and it's for a lot of people it's completely unintelligible so if you're speaking a language that's unintelligible to your audience you're going to lose them you need to learn their language. You know, I once had a situation in a restaurant um, where it was in San Francisco, as a matter of fact, and there was one side of the restaurant that faced the bay, and I wanted to sit on that side. So I said to the hostess, you know, can we sit on that side? And she said, oh, we're outcalled on that one. I said, pardon me? She said, I'm sorry, but we're out cold for the next few hours on that one. I said, what are you talking about? So we have a party sitting there. You know, she's, she's using her language, out cold. I had no idea what that meant. But it meant that that whole area was booked. And I just stood there, like, shaking my head. I had no idea what she was saying. So at every level in your messaging, you've got to be speaking your customer's language. You know, you can't be writing at a 100,000-foot level for people who live on the front line, who are right there, right up against it. They want to know detail. They want to know, you know, what's relevant to them. So going back to what we were, just, we were talking about before the break, you know, the, the two things that will get someone to read your message at, if, in, in an email are the sender name and the subject line. With the sender name, yeah, it's got to be familiar or feel familiar, at least. In other words, um, there's, there's a concept in marketing called unaided name recognition. Basically, you get that through repetition. When people see your name over and over again, they begin to recognize your logo. They begin to recognize your name. Even if they're not consuming your content, the name is sticking in their mind. And then sometimes when they look at your name, they say, oh, I know, I know them, um, which is why you see a lot of companies using names like Columbia. You know, Columbia Outerwear, uh, Columbia Bicycle, Columbia Broadcasting System. Columbia is a very familiar name. We've all heard it somewhere before. And so a lot of people adopt it. I once worked briefly in a, a firm that was called Hamilton Stone. There was no Hamilton. There was no Stone. The guy who started the company just liked the way it sounded. It has because a very it, solid feel to it. Exactly. It's like the old TV show, Remington Steel. You know, it sounds very, for sure, Remington is certainly a well-known brand for a million years. So often you can, you know, craft your, your brand to sound familiar. Um, or you can start regularly messaging to get your name out there over and over again. And even if they're not reading the content, at least you're building on a name recognition, which may translate for you when your, sub, when your uh, sender line uh, gets them to open an email. Um, but another, another way to do it, and the most important way to do it, really, is what I guess everybody would call the right way, which is networking. Uh, I can't overemphasize the importance of networking, of meeting people through people, asking for introductions, getting to know more people, um, even if you can't do anything for them. Uh, you know, some of the organizations you and I have been members of, Laura, all the people we've met there who are today good friends of ours. You know, I think that every industry has associations like that. And even if the sessions that they offer just don't appeal to you, if they have a large attendance, it's worth going just to meet new people. Okay, so uh, so you've got this list, right? Um, a lot of my listeners have client bases, and they're trying to figure out how to, to market to them, but market what they want. You talked about this concept of hearing, hearing on the different levels, mm -hmm. and then creating these subject lines. But, I mean, I get emails... 10 billion times a day. I, I mean, I get so much junk yep. mail, it's ridiculous. And most of them I just throw away, especially if I start seeing in subject lines free or this or the, yep. the house is burning. I'm like, okay, they're trying to sell me something because it, 
that typically has nothing related to the content. How do you balance a provocative subject line with real content? Uh, in some cases, you actually may not. Um, some of the most effective subject lines I've seen are things like, don't open this email. You know, almost nobody can resist opening that email. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, delete this email before opening it. Uh, you know, I mean, that, that that's one tack. I talked about, you know, the network is down, the house is burning, something that describes pain, something that describes, you know, an emergency that, it makes you curious. Okay, so, you, um, so you've got provocative, that. Go provocative is different in every industry, but in the technology industry, you know, there's a couple of things that we know are of appe- you know, are, are appealing to our customers. For example, you know, this new technology won't get you fired. A lot of people can relate to that. Okay. They've made bad choices. It's no longer true that you never get fired for buying IBM. There's no, there's no. Well, there may be some, but it, it, you know. But the the idea that this is safe for your career is important to some people. Okay, but then you have to back it up inside that first paragraph. Yes. To explain yes. why the provocative line. So okay, so there are, there are three things that I want your listeners to remember about marketing messages. The first and foremost is that they are terse. They're brief. People ask me all the time, do you, do you charge by the word? And I'm like, no, I do not charge by the word because that would encourage me to write more. Marketing messages are brief. You want me to write less. You want it to be quick, get in, get out. Because most people don't have the time. And when they see a large block of text, they just go on to the next. So that's the first thing. Second thing, headers are critical. Bold-faced headers allow people to do what all people do, scan. Almost everybody scans an article before they read it because they're looking at the headings to see if there's interesting information in there. So provocative headings that excite your reader are always very beneficial to getting them to read the, the document in the first place. Okay, and the, the third one we're going to have to do right after our last commercial <laughs> break. So to be brief, we'll be right back with more from Howard and Cohen. Okay. <laughs> so Howard, you teased us before the break. So you had three things for people to think about. First, it right. needs to be terse or brief. Headers are critical, creating scan points. And what is the third thing people need to think about? The third thing is the very first thing. It's the first sentence of the first paragraph of the piece. You only have that paragraph. That's it. I'm sorry, you only have that sentence. Um, we, we refer to that sentence as the hook, because if that doesn't hook them, they're not going to read the rest of the, of, the, of the piece. So that first sentence has to be provocative um, and give them good reason to, uh, to read the rest of the piece. And, and by the way, I, I think this is true in any really good reporting, writing, um, any good prose, you, you have a responsibility to show the reader why they should invest their time in reading your piece. Um, so examples of good hooks, um, uh, one of my favorites. Uh, did you hear the one about the CEO who was fired for leaving his door open? It was an article about being careful to log out of email because the best security in the world can be overcome if somebody can get to your computer and it's logged in and your door is open. But the, the subject line didn't, I mean, the, I'm sorry, the hook sentence really didn't tell you that that's what the story was about. It did tease you. So a tease can often be a, a really good hook. Um, if you felt that there was never an answer to this question, you're wrong. You know, people will be curious about, why am I wrong? Um, if you light the house on fire in that first sentence, people will read on to find out what you're talking about. Here's the problem. Um, I, I mentioned before that I do a session called Writing With Your Ear. And as part of that session, we had everybody write a quick marketing letter. 
And then I introduced the concept of the hook. The first sentence has got to be that provocative. And so I had some of them start reading their samples. And you heard things like, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to propose this thing to you. Or you heard, um, I really enjoyed our phone conversation the other day and wanted to get back to you about. Or, hi, I don't know if you remember me, but I'm so-and-so from such-and-such -such company. And so after a few of them read them out, I asked them, the entire audience, do you feel these are compelling hooks? And everybody agreed they weren't. And I said, okay, this is simple. We are all taught to write in certain ways. And more often than not, we're taught to introduce ourselves. Very important that you introduce yourself. The fact is, if the reader didn't know who you are, they're not even going to get this far. So they already know who you are. And introducing yourself, you can do later. You know, you're the least important thing, and that's something we should talk about. You're the least important thing in, in this message. Um, the customer's the most important thing. So the first sentence has to be about them. It has to talk all about them. I would in encourage your listeners to go out and look at 100 different websites, or as many as they can take the time to look at, and count the number of paragraphs that begin with I, we, our, the name of the company, that are about the company that owns that website. And you will find that in the majority of websites, the majority of paragraphs are all about the company, how wonderful they are, how many years they've been in business. The fact is that the reader doesn't care. They don't care how wonderful you are until they know that you have something that they want and you can provide them with a service or a product that they need. So make it about the customer first, and you'll watch as your, your conversions just immediately increase because people like to read about themselves. People want to read about themselves, especially about the things that they want and need and have to have from you. So the hook, that first sentence, it just wasn't compelling in these samples that my, my group read. I asked them all to chop the first paragraph off the email. Just chop it off. Delete it. And then I said, now read me the first sentence of the second paragraph. And one after another, they were reading some really compelling hooks. There they were, hidden in the beginning of the second paragraph. The reason that happens is that we are taught to introduce ourselves and then to give evidence as to why we're writing today. Well, just give the evidence. Don't bother with the introduction. Start with the evidence of here's why we're writing and here's why you should be reading. And it's very different. So the people in that room learn to stop introducing themselves and start with something that's of extreme importance to the reader. That's a great reminder because typically if you're emailing somebody, you already have a relationship with them. Yep. So they've already, you've already gone past that cold call kind of situation. I, I love that. I'm drafting in my head all these, redrafting all these emails that I've recently sent out going, oh, shoot, I can totally see what he's doing. I'm being polite and introducing myself, introducing what the email's about. Why don't I just cut that out and start from the beginning? So, Howard, yep. we're coming up to the end of the show, and people are asking me, how do they get in touch with you? Oh, that's very easy. I am an email fanatic. Uh, I'm always on email. I answer email all day, all night. Um, my wife has tried dropping my mobile in, in water. That didn't work. <laughs> um, but my email address is hmc at hmcrightnow.com. You just have to make sure that you spell right right. It's H-M-C-W-R-I-T-E-N-O-W.com, H-M-C at H-M-C-Right-Now.com. Um, by far the easiest way to reach me. That's also my Skype handle. Um, um, you know, I, people ask me why I live in the middle of nowhere. I tell them I don't. I live in south nowhere. <laughs> um, so the only way I get to see a friendly face is often on Skype uh, or Facebook. Uh, messenger. Um, but I'm absolutely out there on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, and easily reached by any of those. So Great. And I know you're always putting out really great content for people, not just for the clients you're working with, but just 
overall in general about life and writing and your journey? Well, one thing I would suggest, I, you know, if people want to see my writing, um, I think I'm doing what every good writer should do. Uh, I have a, a Facebook page, uh, HMC Right Now. And when I post, because I tweet out every article I write for every publication and every client, I, I'm always promoting the people who hire me. Um, and everything I've written is posted on that HMC Right Now Facebook page. So it's easily reached. Perfect. So it's a great way for people to see examples of how they can be doing things better in their businesses. Yep. With their writing. So thanks so much for being on the show today, Howard. Laura, thank you so much. This was such a, such an enjoyable hour. It really, really was. It goes way too fast. Yeah. So everybody, we had the joy of being with Howard M. Cohen today of HMCRightNow.com, talking about how you can create compelling marketing content. Love to hear from you. Tweet out to at the Laura Stewart, and Howard's is at Howard M. Cohen. Let us see some samples of how your writing is changing to create compelling marketing content. And remember, everybody, the right question can change your life. So what are you asking today? Have a great day, everyone, and right now. You've been listening to It's All About the Questions, starring Laura Stewart. Connect with Laura at itsallaboutthequestions.com and download a free workbook that will help you ask better questions starting today. 